Hi, this is Nancy with Quilting with Nancy and On Point TV. Thank you for joining me for our next quilt series. Um, this series kind of came about because I was recording or I was designing a quilt, totally not this, and ended up putting this crossing block, the one here, together and started thinking about all the different ways that I could use that crossing block and I came up with the quilt. So here is a couple of the quilts. This will be the applique quilt. Um, this one I will talk to you about the applique in a little bit, but for now we are going to start with the piece quilt. Now I'm going to flip back to the applique a second, but I want you to look at the piece quilt and look how the crossing blocks are here. And then the center is a pieced center and the outside squares are a square and a square, the economy block. When we go back to the applique, you can see that the center is applique and the outside squares are also applique. So the book is going to give you that option. So it's a book is, there we go, that's the book. This is the Four Crossings book. I've been working on it for a while, um, been through many, many edits. I'm hoping that it's right now. So just know that writing a pattern is the hardest part of this whole job that I do. We are gonna start with the idea of you taking the book and recoloring it because you know that when you purchase a pattern or a book it is very rare that you have the ability to get the exact same fabrics that the designer or author used in the book and this quilt actually got a little bit confusing. So I came up with a couple of different ways. One of them that's gonna be in the book should be very, very helpful to you also. So starting with in the book, there is the color ways that you receive in the book. And so here I've used one method is to use little post-it notes. As I was doing that, I came up with another idea. So first off, taking little snippets of your chosen fabrics and taping them over the little tab. So this one tells you what you know the pieces are used for, how much fabric you need, cutting little tabs of fabric. But when it comes time to actually work on the blocks, could you take little snippets of fabric and cover each space? You could, but that's gonna get a little monotonous. What I started, by, and it was so totally random, I looked into my stash, I'm like, how am I gonna you know, figure out, I wanna put it down here what they are, but I didn't wanna actually write in the book because I don't wanna have to go back and erase things, even if I use a friction pen or a pencil. And I came up with this. Now this is kind of funny because I purchased these to label product and I kept wondering to myself, boy, I wonder why that those labels don't actually stick in place on the product. And then I noticed this word down here that maybe you can't see, but it says removable. Well, that would make sense why it didn't work very well on my product. This is Avery's product, 5418. You could probably pick it up at any office supply place. But what I was able to do is stick it down and then when I'm done with this, these little guys, will come right up once I get my, there. They just peel right up. They don't leave any residue in the book. So then you're able to work with that over and over again. I also found that to be quite helpful when it came to the piecing. So here, instead of, because I've got the picture with the green fabric and a gold fabric, just like it is in my block, but yours isn't gonna be green and gold. Might be, but if not. So instead I was able to put those little stickers down. So this block was made with the space fabric and the gold. This one is made with the gold circles in the space fabric. So just one way for me to mark it up so that I could, kind of keep track of what I was doing. The other way is one of my favorite ways and that's to actually put it in electric quilt. So I do electric quilt, I do a lot of different designing on electric quilt. I also have online classes available in electric quilt. So if you've ever wondered, you know, I bought that program or I'm interested in that program, but I just can't ever figure out how to actually use it because it's pretty, it's an all encompassing program. Um, but it is very user friendly once somebody gives you the little push that you need to start doing the designer. And, and that is one of my membership levels. So whereas YouTube is free, always free to everybody, when you go to the membership, that's where you can actually pay for additional videos. And that's where the EQ classes come in. So if you go to the join button below, you'll see that there's beginner level, that 
pretty much says, thank you, Nancy, for doing videos for free. We really appreciate it. The second level is the designer level. And that is telling, that is saying, yes, thank you for doing videos. But that also means that you're able to join me monthly when I do the Zoom meetings for EQ. And when you are a member, you actually can go back and watch all of the other videos. The third level is the quilt addict, which I know we all are. But if you want to be in the quilt addict membership, that means that you can do the EQ classes and you get an e-copy of all the books that I write as we're doing the videos. So check that out if you have any questions. If you do join, please send me your email because without your email, I am not able to send you the links for the perks and stuff. So just kind of, that was a little sidebar. So back to the quilt. So this is what I did in Electric Quilt. So with Electric Quilt, I can just click on fabrics and fill in the blanks. And this is the coloring that I have. But I know that everybody doesn't have electric quilt. So this is what is in the book. In the book is a line drawing of mainly the center block. I didn't do this with all of the blocks because the other blocks are not as confusing as the center block is. So on the center block, I wrote what the um, block number is in the book. And then this is your pack of color pencils. Remember a few years ago when everybody was doing adult coloring, you all bought the color pencils. Now's the time to use it. So then you're able to not get quite so confused when you're putting the blocks together and when you're you know, deciding what fabrics to cut. So that is step one. The next thing we want to do is prepare our fabrics. Oh, this is the this is the new colorway that I'm working on. I had purchased some of this space fabric. And from the space fabric, I kind of made everything else work together. So what we're going to do now is work on preparing your fabric. If you have ever watched any of my videos, you know that I've told you about spray sizing your fabric before you start cutting it. So on a quilt like this, I would look into the instructions. And for instance, there's a it says to cut a three and a half inch wide piece of fabric W, whatever the case may be. I would actually cut a three and three quarter inch piece of fabric and then take that fabric to the iron and spray size it so it's really stiff. The problem is I say that and people think they know what I mean by that, but I'm going to take you now to my ironing board so that you can see what I really mean when I'm saying that. So here at my ironing board, I have one of the fabrics. So this one was one that needed to be cut maybe three and a quarter or something like that. And I cut it the three and a half. So it's a little bit bigger. And this fabric I chose to show you this with because you can really see how wet it is. Now on my, this is my big board. I have one of those felt um, pressing surfaces. I really like it. I do spray size on it. People tell me all the time that they're, they're told that they're not supposed to do that. And with this, I'm going to use this product. This is called Faultless by Magic. This is newer since maybe about 2020. Um, and I have absolutely fallen in love with it. One of the things I've fallen in love with it, about it is the spray nozzle. Um, I think the liquid works as well as any of the other spray sizings that are on the market, but that spray nozzle is phenomenal. The other tool I'm going to use is the HTV iron. This is a very large iron and the, you can go, you see the picture showing you a temperature of 310 degrees. I think it can go to like 450. It was really created for people doing vinyl, iron on vinyl, but I started using it with the, doing the fabrics when I'm spray sizing it. And when I do fusible applique, which we'll do in another, um, another video. Um, so these are the two that I'm going to show you now. So I'm at my iron and I've taken my my ironing board and I've taken my iron. Now this iron, this is the one that I have. It does come in some other pretty colors now too. And it has this really big silicone base. What's really fabulous about this iron is that the face plate on it is flat. There are no steam holes on the iron and it is 10 inches square. That is much bigger than your normal iron. So when you're doing what I'm going to be doing right now, it goes so much faster. I've got the temperature up to 400. Here I've got my magic spray sizing. And when I tell you I am spraying the fabric, 
I am saturating the fabric. I am not misting the fabric like a gentle woman would do. No, I am going to saturate that fabric because I want this fabric to be about as stiff as a piece of copy paper. And then I can bring my iron in and I'm going to start it just moving it a little bit as I go. There we go. And as it goes, the very, very first time you set it down, the iron does kind of want to stick, and that's true of any sizing I've ever used. But then as you get it moving, it stops doing that. Let me get this back over here. All right. And look at how quickly it's already dried. That just does not happen with your normal domestic iron. Now, what I'm, I'm not saying that you will never have to use your domestic iron again. Of course, you're going to use your domestic iron for all the seam pressing that you do. But when it comes to preparing your fabric for when you're doing your rotary cutting, when the fabrics in particular are done in small triangles like flying geese, if you will prepare it like this, it just makes the process go so much faster. Now, I have told you a hundred times that I am not a pre-washer of fabric. Some people are because they, you know, it might shrink a little bit. Um, some people also do because of bleed. I don't really worry too much about that. But in terms of the shrinking, if you do this, it will do any of the pre-shrinking the fabric will do. So now it's all crisp. It's not, I mean, look at how crisp that is. All right. So that is how I prepare my fabric before I start doing the cutting. All right. So now we're going to do some of the cutting and I want to show you just some little tricks in doing the cutting because in the book, there's some different, there's some different cuts. So what I mean by that, let me get to my page. Here it is. I'm going to cut the background fabric. There. So I've chosen just a muslin so that you'll be able to see what I'm actually working on. Right. And I like using my, this is my little OmniGrid spinner mat. I really love this mat because this is going to be able to spin around without knocking everything, even my mouse, knocking everything off on the corners. Sometimes it doesn't work because it's not huge. I think this one is the 14, yeah, I think it's 14 inches, but I, it, most of the time it's going to be just fine. And I always fold my fabrics in quarters. So this is it folded in half. So that would be about 22 inches. And then I'll fold it in quarters, lining up the selvage edge with the fold and making sure that the bottom fold is laying very flat. Then I'm going to take my ruler line my ruler up so that the horizontal line of my ruler is on the bottom fold. If you want more information on this, there's quite a few videos and I'll put a link below where you can see all about my, how I fold my fabric and, and how I do the cutting. There's my cut. All right. Now I can spin my mat and now I can make the cut. So for this cut, the instructions say to cut one four and a quarter inch strip. So lining up on the vertical edge of the fabric, I've lined up at four and a quarter. And I also can line up at the top, making sure that it is still horizontally correct and square. Make that cut. Now I have one four and a quarter inch strip. Now the instructions say to cut two four and a quarter inch squares. So I'm gonna open up that strip. So I have two layers of fabric here, one, two. I'm gonna square off the selvage edge there, the selvage is gone. Again, spin the mat around. Now I can make four and a quarter inch squares. The next thing the instructions say is to, from the remaining piece of the fabric, cut it down to two and three eighths inches wide. So I'm gonna line my fabric back up, lay my ruler down at two and three eighths inches wide. So the idea here is there's sometimes that you only need small pieces and I didn't want you to cut a four and a quarter inch strip and a two and a three and a quarter inch strip. So this way you're taking that fabric and cutting it down to size. And from the two and three eighths inch, I said three quarter, I meant three eighths. I need four of those squ of squares. So I'm gonna now, I've, my edge is straight because I just finished cutting. And in this case, I'm going to line it up at two and three eighths. 
move it and do another two and three eighths. That's going to give me my four squares. And I do love when, when I do the spray sizing, when I have those squares cut, my fabric literally feels like a deck of cards so that I can get everything all lined up and that just feels good to me. Okay. Then I'm from that, I'm going to cut it down to another smaller strip down to two inches. And this time I need to cut as many two inch squares as I can get. Um, you are going to cut one more two inch strip. So this time I'm going to leave it folded. Oh yeah, I think I'll be able to get them all from here. So this will be four layers thick. Spin that around. And I'm since I've got four layers, four times three is 12. So I need three two inch cuts. So I'm going to do a little bit of power cutting. So starting at six, cut off that fold. Now I can slide it over to two. Always looking that I'm lining up my horizontal and my vertical lines. Now I can slide it down to two. So I went from six to four to two. I think I said my numbers wrong there. And bada boom, bada bing, I have 12 little squares. Now the next thing you're going to want to do, especially with this particular project, is you are going to want to label these stacks as to what the fabric is. So I have, these are the three pieces that I just cut. I'm going to use a friction pen in this case. So a friction pen is one that is, um, it, it races with heat. So you can, if you're writing on paper, let's see if this will work. If I'm writing on just regular paper, when it dries, it can be erased with the little friction eraser that is on it. But in the world of fabric, if you just set an iron on top of it, it'll work. You do want to test your fabric, make sure that it's not noticeable um, after you iron it off. Sometimes on dark fabrics it shows. But this is a C, this is a C, and this is a C. And I would do that on all of my fabrics as I'm cutting them. I would say, this is fabric C, this is fabric D, this is fabric E. That's gonna help you not get so confused. If you don't have a friction pen, another option is your chalk pencil. So this is the Boheme chalk pencil, the mechanical pencil that I use so much. So we've got, I'm gonna have all of my pieces cut. And when we come back, I'm gonna show you how to start piecing this quilt. So I have all of my fabrics prepared and I've got everything cut and I'm going to take you on to the next step. The next step in this quilt is making the flying geese. So I'm going to show you three different ways to make the flying geese, but I want you to know that we'll be using the no waste method. There are a lot of different ways to make flying geese. I generally like a way that's going to use the tools that I own already own so I don't particularly like to buy a brand new tool just to make one item. Now, having said that, at the end, when it comes to the trimming of it, I am going to show you a specific tool just used for trimming down flying geese, but you'll know how to do it one way or the other. So I've got all my pieces cut. There they are, everything you see. I've got labels. Sometimes you can see the label, sometimes you can't, but I can see it and that's all that matters. To do this next step, we need to mark or not mark our fabric. Now that'll make more sense here in a little bit. But the idea, here are the three options and this is how I mark them and I'll show you what the sewing process is for that. So the first marking method would be to mark the three lines. Marking a center line. And if you have an older machine whose needle cannot be moved to the right or to the left, then you're going to want to mark your sewing lines. And so the sewing line is marked a scant quarter of an inch away from that center line. So my line, I don't think you can see it, but the mark center marked line is just to the right of this quarter inch. And I am using a fine tipped pen. This is a friction pen again. So now I'm going to mark my second sewing line. So this would be the technique again for marking your fabric if you do don't have a machine whose needle can move to the right or the left. The next would for, be for people that have a machine whose needle can move to the right and I will show you how to make the adjustment that you need to make but all you need is one line. I'm also going to show you a 
method where you don't need to mark any lines at all. And it is done using this product. Let me see. Um, there it is. This is called Diagonal Seam Tape, and it's from Cluck Cluck so this is available at firesidequilts.com. All the links will be below for all of these products. But when you look at this product, you can see that there is a center red line, and that is going to be lined up with my needle. And then there's also those two quarter inch lines. I'll show you how to use that for this type of a technique. It's really very, very fun. So we're going to go over to my machine and get started. All right, so I'm here at my machine and I've got it all set up. And I'm going to first do the sewing process where there are lines drawn on. So this would be one that I've drawn the center line and the two outside lines. So I have my square on top of a large square. And this is for the no waste method of flying geese. Keep in mind, I find this method to be pretty amazing. I don't know who came up with it, but they were really a visionary in my mind. So now with my machine just set up in the middle position, I'm going to sew on that sew line. So you can go here and take out your pins if you would like to. I don't always take out my pins, but I don't like people to be nervous either. Check my upper thread. We're going to have to redo that whole... No, the upper thread is just fine. When I get to the end of this, if I were doing quite a few of these, I would just take and put my next piece in. But since we're just doing this little demo, I'm just going to take another piece. Oops, wiggled the camera. Take another piece. So that's going to be my ender working with leaders and enders. So that's just a scrap piece of fabric that I pulled out of the trash. Now I'm going to come back. And now that piece is now my leader. So now I'm going to go in the other direction, sewing right on that line. Then I'm going to come back to my leader, which I think was back here. There it is. Oops, wiggled the camera again. I'm going to go straight. Good. All right, going off here. So that's the one technique. So now I'm going to show you the next technique. This is the one where you'll actually just sew a, draw a center line. And what I need to now do is move my needle to be a scant quarter of an inch from the edge of my foot. So to do that, I need to have a ruler. And if you'll place your ruler right underneath the foot. So here I'm going to raise up my foot a little bit high. Place the ruler so that the edge of my ruler is lined up with my foot. So if I put it all the way down, the edge of the ruler is lined up with the foot. All right. Now I'm going to move my needle. So with this electronic machine, I can just move the needle in my stitch edit. And I'm going to move it over to about right there. And then I always want to test and bring my needle down and I can look through my foot and go, no, that's a little bit wide, Nancy. Let's bring it a little bit back to the left. There, now that's a scant quarter of an inch from the edge of the foot. So now I'm gonna start sewing with the foot on that drawn line. Remember that drawn line that I made? I'm gonna sew right over the top of that, lining up the right hand edge of my foot with that little pencil line that I drew. I'm going to find my leader. There it is. I need to go back again. Come to the end. And like I said, if I were doing this, I would be piecing them all in one big line. All right, now I'm flipping over to the other side. So this technique, again, is what you will do if you can move your needle to the right or to the left. And then you're just sewing right on the right hand edge of the foot. Next I'm going to show you how to do it with the cluck cluck sew. 
All right, the third technique I want to show you is going to use the cluck cluck tape. So this is the diagonal seam tape. Now keep in mind, it comes as a very large roll and it's a washi tape. Washi tape is kind of like a low tack masking tape. And the idea is you are just going to attach it to your machine so that the center line is lined up with your needle. So right here, you see how it's lined up? I'm going to cut it off and then I'll have more when I take it off and it won't stick forever because it is a low tack tape. Okay. So now I'm going to start with my next one. This has no lines drawn on it at all. I'm going to show you piecing two different ones. The idea is I'm going to line up the front point to that quarter inch line and just kind of shimmy it in on up into place so that it's a quarter of an inch. And then down here at the bottom, it's going to line up at the quarter inch. And you'll see it as I move it up where you can see that the corner is lining up at the quarter. We can't quite get that shot, but you'll see what I mean. So as I'm sewing, I am just looking down here at the bottom. I'm not paying attention to what my needle is doing. My eyes are directed down here at the quarter inch. That is getting me a seam a quarter of an inch to the left from center. As I get to the end of this piece, I'm going to pick up the next section that needs to be done, get all my fabrics lined up. Now I'm going to line up the point on the left hand side. So the first time I lined up the point on the right hand quarter inch mark, now I'm going to line it up on the left hand side and that just scooches right on in. As it advances, you'll see that I'm lining up the bottom of the square on the left hand side of the quarter inch. Now when I can take and cut it off from the back, take off my leader. Now I'm going to start on the other side. So this one, the point was following the left hand side. Now to do the second line, I'm going to ride, ride this one on the right hand side again. This is the line that I have already stitched. So now I'll start it and it'll go to the other side of center. And then I'll spin this around, get my next one off the back. Doing chain piecing, so that's kind of a standard in quilting these days, is chain piecing, stitching one right after another. Now I'm gonna line this up with the left hand side. So this technique means that you don't have to do any of that drawing on your fabric, but it is also not for everyone. To be able to follow that line as it's moving up the tape is not something, you know, if you're brand new to quilting, I don't think that this is the technique you're going to want to do. If you're brand new to quilting, this probably is the technique you'll want to do where you've actually drawn the lines on both sides. And once you get a little bit more advanced and you have a machine that can move its needle, you'll want to come to the technique where you just draw the center line and then sew the scant quarter of an inch on either side. Once you feel comfortable with those two, then maybe consider giving the diagonal tape a method. I think it's a really big time saver and I'm just as accurate as with this as I am with drawing the lines. Now I've got my sewn pieces and I've come back to my cutting board and it's time to cut these pieces right down the middle. I do like to press them before I cut, but you'll just be cutting right down the middle. Now you can use a sharp pair of scissors or you can use your rotary cutter mat and ruler. Now you'll have two of the four pieces that you'll be making and press the small triangle up. So I'm just finger pressing it here, but I would actually do this at my big iron with a little bit of steam to make sure it's very, very flat. The next step is to use your remaining two squares and you'll take those squares and set them right between the two small squares that are pressed up. Now when you're doing this, you'll know that everything is working right if that little valley is a quarter of an inch from the edge and you'll draw the same line that you'd been drawing before and on either side if you need to, but you'll just sew a scant quarter of an inch on either side. All right, so I have gone to the machine and I've done all the parts and I wanna show you the final piecing step that happens 
and how to trim these flying geese down. Okay. So this is where, here, let's move these out of the way so it's maybe not so cluttered. This is where I left you, where we were sewing the line on either side of the drawn line or the center, depending on what technique you were using. Now we're going to cut on the cut line, which is the center one, which will yield you two pieces that look like this, that are just look really, really odd until you've done it. Once you've done it a few times, you won't be as shocked as you are the first time because this gets pressed up and then you say, voila, because now you have a flying geese. So each large, you'll have one large square and four small squares are going to go from the first step, then the second, and then you will have four flying geese that are all the same. After you have your flying geese made, it's time to trim them down. So I'm going to start by showing you the technique using just the rulers that you already own. So this is my OmniGrid ruler. These are the brands that I like best. And with a ruler, I'm sorry, nope, I can't use that one. I have to use a square one. Okay, you have to use a square one because you have to have that diagonal line that goes all the way up. Let me see if I can show you that better on paper. There, the diagonal line that goes all the way up to the corner. You have to have that in order to trim these. So with that, you're going to start with your flying goose. And I like to imagine the point of the flying goose is the nose. So this is going to sound a little bit silly, but the goose is flying right at me. Do you see that? This is the nose of the goose and he is wah, flying right at me, okay? So with the goose flying right at you, lay your square ruler down. Now these are gonna be trimmed down to one and a half by three inches. The first step is to lie that diagonal down. Actually, let me get another color, see if this is easier to see. Yep, I think that'll be easier to see. Line up the diagonal line so it is on the right-hand side of the nose of the goose. Okay, the goose is pointing toward me. Here's my diagonal line. And then sort of analyze the block. The, the width of the block should be three and a half. I'm looking over here. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be able to get just about three and a half there. And coming up this way, it'll be two inches. So it finishes one and a half by three. So it's trimmed to two by three and a half. All right. So with that there, I can do the right hand trim and the top trim. All right. Now spin that block around. Now I'm going to put it right into three and a half by two. There. Now I do want to make sure that the nose of the goose is a at least a quarter of an inch from the top of that seam. So here is the quarter inch mark. And the nose, that yellow part, is that quarter of an inch. So we're good there. All right. That's how you trim that block. So we're going to do it one more time. So line it up so the goose is flying toward me. Line the diagonal up, coming all the way to the top. Analyze the block. Make sure you're centered as much as you can, keeping that diagonal set right here and the three and a half inch point should also be on the di the second diagonal so this diagonal of the ruler is on the right hand diagonal of the goose the three and a half is on the left hand diagonal cut cut spin it around now cut it right down to three and a half by two Right there, double checking that the nose has at least that little bit of a quarter of an inch. Oops, stay put, little guy. All right, now this is the way to do it with the rulers that you own. And I always appreciate that I can use the rulers that I already own. So for this, you only need to have a small-ish ruler. This one happens to be a 5x5 five five OmniGrid. But any square ruler is going to have the diagonal line that goes up to the center. But now let me tell you about another product. This is one of those specialty products that if you purchase it, you're going to use this size quite often, the two, one and a half by three finished. My learning to quilt, you need to make 40 in this size if you choose to do my learning to quilt. This one has, I don't know, maybe 12 or 14 just for the center block. Um, but 
this ruler can only trim a flying goose one and a half by three. Now, I know there are other rulers out there with um, other artists and designers that have come up with other techniques. You need to use the ruler that makes you the happy and gives you, makes you happy and gives you the most accurate um, piecing. But this little ruler pretty much is only going to be available on Block Lock's website. So underneath, I will have a link to where it is available on their website. Um, I don't get any affiliate sales or anything from them, but I still think that this is a fabulous ruler to have. Um, same with the iron. The iron is a fabulous, that big um, 10 by 10 iron, the link is below for you to be able to find that. I don't get any affiliate sales with them either, but I think it's a great product. To use this ruler, you, it is best to have a little spinning mat. So this is my little OmniGrid, Omni Grid spinning spinning mat that is available at Fireside Quilts. Most of the supplies I'm telling you about are available at Fireside Quilts, and the link will be below. With this, this little shadowing that you see is actually a groove cut in the ruler. These seams are all facing up. If you look at it from the back side, you can see that the seam is facing up. When you take that ruler and set so that those seams are in that little groove, it's solid. It's not going to move. So for this, there's no analyzing the little block needed. You just set it down, hold it, cut and spin, cut and spin, cut and spin. This is by far the easiest way to cut flying geese, to trim them down. I have found none other, and I have I've tried quite a few of the other versions of the flying geese rulers. Do what works for you. For me, this ruler rocks. There. So just like that, I have my little pieces all trimmed out. Now I want to show you some of the different coloring options that are available so that you can kind of come up with. So for instance, this is what the original block was colored as. I colored this one on EQ. It all went around with the quilt that is hanging behind me. This is the new colored one that I'm going to show you the actual block here in a second. And with this one, I did change up the coloring a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the original. Do you see where the red and the light green are in this block? When I made my new colored block, I actually swapped the red out for the background again, just because I thought it would be fun. Now this is what that block looks like in real life. This is the one with the little space on it. I've got the um, different blues going on. It's actually going to be a TARDIS quilt, TARDIS being the time and relative dimension in space, the spaceship that Doctor Who actually flies in. So all of the nerds out there are going, woohoo! And those of you that are not nerds are going, what is that Nancy talking about? Just trust me on this. Those that know are in the know. So here is the space. There'll be some moons and some other space things. And this is the colorway that we are just working on. So I like to take it, it is now on my super big 20 inch, 20 and a half, 20 and a half inch square Omni grid. And I've taken and laid out all of the pieces. So these are the two last pieces that I had to add that I just trimmed, this little guy here. And what was very nice was I was looking at that chart that I had colored when it came to doing the layout. I found it was kind of confusing without a colored chart. When I was doing the TARDIS one, even though I had the one like this that I had done in EQ, it still got confusing. And I found that when I used the one from the book where all of the fabrics are labeled and I colored them in with my pencils, well, it just went together quite nicely. So this is kind of too big. So let me show you. There we go. Don't get seasick on me. All right. This is the block that I'm going to put together. Now, I love putting it on like a big mat like this, so then I can take it right to my sewing machine and do my sewing. I do want to go to the sewing machine and show you, show, show you just a couple of the tricky little things that you'll run into. So these are one of the tricky little parts. I'm going to put those together for now so I'll remember what I'm doing. And... I'll just pick one of these other ones so you'll kind of get the idea. And we will go to my machine. 
All right, at my machine, it is time for me to set up the second way to do the scant quarter inch seam allowance. So let me cut my thread off here. Now I'm gonna leave my guidelines, The di I'm sorry, my diagonal seam tape here. It can still stay there um, until it's time for me to do something else. But now I'm gonna use the guideline seam guide. And this is gonna help you so much with an accurate seam allowance. So just like we did the other one where I put my ruler down and I moved my needle over to the right so that I was going to my scant quarter inch seam allowance. So using your ruler, move that over and then put this down. Now, if you are not able to move your needle, Guidelines does have a really cool little plastic um, measuring tape. It really, really works. Um, that's really great if you cannot move your needle, but I can, so I will. Now my seam guide is set up. So I will be sewing with as close to perfect to a scant quarter of an inch seam as I can get, always starting with my leader. So now I'm gonna start with this first two. So this little piece has to go on to my flying goose. I'm gonna flip it over and when possible, I like to start on the bulky part of the seam. So if you look at this, the bulky part of the seam is where the seam is. Down here, there is no bulk. I like to start where the bulk is and I find my piecing comes out more accurate. And here, I'm just gonna keep the seam riding inside my guideline seam. These little flying geese are a little bit trickier. For the most part, the seaming is gonna, the arrows are gonna tell you which way to press all of your pieces as you're putting them together. But when it comes to the two flying geese that go together, the seams are in the exact same direction. That can make for a very bulky seam. So what I like to do is flip the seam on one of the geese. So I'm gonna flip that and I'm gonna flip the other so that when I put them right sides together, I'm gonna flip one of the seams, this top one right here, and put a pin in it. Then I'm gonna to come to the second one. Again, flip that seam, butt them right together, sorry for the reach, put a pin in it. All right. Now I'm gonna sew right over that seam. One seam is going one way, one seam is going the other way. Please don't freak out. Yes, I know I just sewed over my pins and I'm okay with that. Sewing over a pin with a small ball head pin like this will make a big, big difference. And then sew off onto my leader. And let me show you how that worked out with flipping that seam. All right, so that's what it kind of looks like here. And you'd take and set that seam first, but then when you flip it up, those are gonna match just about as close as can possibly match. So let's go back up to my design table and see if we can finish working on this quilt. All right, so I've got my extra pieces sewed together. I'm going to lay them all down into the block. I'm going to get the block all together. And the next time we get together, we will start working on the crossing blocks. Oh, no, no, no. The next time we get together, we're going to do the fusible applique. So you'll have the two options for the center of the quilt all figured out. Then we'll move on to the crossing blocks. So if you have any questions about the quilt, the book is available on my website which is quiltingwithnancy.com. My email is quilting, no, na no. Yeah, my email is quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com. I knew it was in there somewhere. Um, the products are all listed below. So most of the supplies that we're looking at, those are listed below at Fireside Quilts. The cool iron that I showed you and the block lock, those are not available. You've got to pick those up from the manufacturer. We did have another thought too. So let's say that you're thinking that you would like to design this quilt, but picking the fabrics for your quilt is not your favorite part of the quilt making process. It happens to be mine. It happens to be my friend Cheryl's. I mean, we all have our different favorite part of designing quilts and I love picking the fabric, but it is not everybody's favorite thing. If you would like some help, I can help you out. If you want to go to Fireside Quilts and start looking at the fabrics there, send me an email with a few of the fabrics that you have chosen, then I can choose the other fabrics from a 
fireside quilts and designed it for you on electric quilt a way that you'll know what colors you're getting you'll know how much fabric you're going to get you'll get a color picture of what the quilt is going to look like and we can all do that we can do that through me working with electric quilt and fireside quilt having all the fabric that you need so if you have any questions about that contact me at quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com. This is part one of five on this quilt. I hope I will see you in part two. Have a great day.